From the beginning of Montana's distinctive yet troubled history, the Treasure State was dominated, both economically and politically, by powerful outside interests who shipped in capital and bought control of the state. Historians tell us that as the Anaconda Company and its friends ran Montana, economic and political power flowed out into the hands of distant capitalists and corporations. Policy was determined in far off New York City and control of the press was rigid. Anaconda's corporate dominance in Montana's political affairs was unique in American history. For its first 75 years, Montana was a one company state. But then big winds of change roared across the treasure state. Between 1965 and 1980, Montanans ripped off their copper collar, transforming Montana from a corporate colony into a free modern state. The people finally control their own destiny. The pitched battle between the people and the established power structure was not easily won, but fired in a crucible of change, a new Montana was born. Join Evan Barrett and real history makers of the time as they shine a light on this remarkable era. Welcome to another episode of In the Crucible of Change. And today we're gonna to have a chance to uh, talk about one of the absolutely most important uh, persons in creating the dramatic uh, period of progressive change in Montana, and, and that is uh, former Governor Forrest Anderson. And uh, we're, we have a really special guest today who uh, served on Forrest staff, and that's Alec Hansen. Uh, Alec went to work uh, for uh, Governor Anderson in September of 1969, which was about two weeks after I showed up there to work on the, his reorganization effort. And uh, uh, you were there through most of his entire term in office. And, and uh, I want to mention that uh, uh, the thing that struck me about as when one looks back at Forrest is is how uniquely qualified he was to be governor and what a difference that made, that he had served in the legislature for a term, he'd been a county attorney, uh, he'd been on the Supreme Court, and had been attorney general for 12 years prior to becoming governor. So it's almost hard to find anyone that would have been as well prepared as a governor as, as Forrest was when he, when he entered that, uh, that office. Well, I think you can probably go back through Montana history and uh, you would never find somebody that bring that level of qualification to the office. Like you said, he was a county attorney here in Lewis and Clark. Uh, he'd been on the Supreme Court. Uh, he'd served in the legislature as a representative of Helena. And he had 12 years of experience as attorney general. And a lot of that was very, you know, vital experience, a lot of dealing with uh, institutions. Uh, he was involved in the prison riot in Deer Lodge in the late 50s. And so when he stepped into that office, he had, uh, you know, he, he was qualified. He was ready. And he had the relevant experience. And uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people have a tough time finding their feet when they first assume a political office. You know, and you hear the term hit the ground running. I don't even know if that was there in those days. I mean, I don't know if that term was even used. But if it was, he was the guy that did it. I mean, they started off right away with some really good ideas. And they, you know, the thing that's amazing is this guy promoted probably as much change and new progressive ideas as anybody in the history of Montana. And he was a one-term governor. It is pretty astounding. And if you, and the change actually, when you think about it, uh, the 1968 election, that there'd been 16 years of Republican governors uh, and the power structure of Montana was clearly uh, locked into place. Uh, uh, he, uh, uh, the Anaconda Company was very, very strong still, the Montana Power Company, the corporate interests, the stock growers. Uh, he came into office uh, uh, after that 16 years of Republican governors. His, but it wasn't easy for him. He had a challenge right on the Democratic side, the progressive side, uh, in the primary. Uh, he had to run against uh, primarily Eugene Mahoney, who was the Senate Majority Leader in 1967 and had successfully fended off the sales tax in the legislature in 67. So he was kind of the darling of the left, if you will. Uh, and Leroy Anderson, another Anderson, who was the Eastern District Congressman who was a Democrat, uh, those two together ran against Forrest in the Democratic primary. 
And uh, uh, Forrest ended up with uh, uh, about 39% of the vote. Mahoney had about 35% of the vote. Uh, Anderson, Leroy Anderson was way behind, but he sprung out of that to run against Tim Babcock, who was the incumbent governor. And you know, you don't beat incumbent governors very often, and yet uh, his win over Tim Babcock was fairly dramatic. He, he won by 12 percentage point, 54 percent to 42 percent. It was a dramatic win. Uh, you were working in the press at that time uh, in uh, 1968, uh, just coming out of Vietnam and working with the Montana Standard, weren't you? Yeah, I started at the Standard in November of 68. I wasn't involved at all in that uh, election campaign. <laughs> Most of what I know about that I read or I, people told me. But I think one thing that's... Uh, you know that's important in that particular campaign. Uh, you know, Kurt, Forrest was what they call pragmatic or practical. I mean, he was a common sense guy, and he got accused for being middle of the road. And he said one time, "Yeah, I'm middle of the road because that's where the people of Montana are. They're in the middle of the road, and I represent them." And I think that showed up in that election. I think, you know, you might have had Mahoney on one side and Leroy on the other side. And, force right there in the middle where the votes were and I, that's probably how he won. And I think when you get into the fall and uh, against Tim Babcock, you know, that's when pay more what for came along. I mean, Duke Crowley came up with that. That's probably the most effective well-known political slogan in Montana history and it's a simple thing is uh, you know, if you like me there's not going to be a sales tax and it won't be tried and I won't even think about it. If you like the other guy, you might have to deal with that. And I think people in Montana uh, didn't want, I think they were concerned about how ineffective government was and they sure as hell didn't want to pay any more than they'd already paid and that was the whole heart of that slogan. It's a few words, but the simple words delivers a very powerful message. Well, yeah, you think of those four words, pay more, what for, uh, seemed to be the driving thing in that entire election and it again that sprung out of the big big fight they had in 67 where Jim Felt was the speaker of the house and they really hard pushed the sales tax very very hard and it took and the democrats in the senate under Mahoney fought it back and uh, I think the fact that it had been a big issue for Mahoney and he didn't survive the primary, I think some people thought maybe Forrest wouldn't be as tough on it, but he, he had the instinct, I think, to say, I can take these four words, pay more what for, yeah. and I can convey a message to Montanans that they'll listen to, and boy, they did. I mean, it was a big, big win for him. Yeah, up until that time, that's one of the biggest pluralities in a, you know, an election for governor in Montana history. But I mean, it's a very simple message. You know, and that, and that whole thing plays out through the remainder of his term as governor, the, you know, the thing about the sales tax. Now, the sales tax has been a divisive and dominant issue in Montana politics, you know, since long before I was interested in this business. And, uh, you know, in those days, the Montana economy was much different than it is today. Natural resource taxes were 30, 35, 40 percent of the total tax base of the state. And I think what the, you know, the promoters of the sales tax, particularly on the corporate side, what they were interested in was getting out from under property taxes or severance taxes or natural resource taxes and shifting the burden from production to consumption. Well, that's not a good deal for the working man. And that's what for, you know, that's where you are when you're in the middle of the road. Those are the guys that you represent. Those are the people, those working people. Those are the people that put him in there, the guys in Butte, Anacon, and Billings, wherever they might be, in the refineries. And why should they pay on consumption when these corporations were perfectly capable of paying on production and value? So, you know, that was the whole idea there. That's the philosophical question. But since that time, and I'm guilty of this, uh, I've changed my opinion a little bit on the sales tax, mainly because I work for the cities who need the money. But the other reason is, is the economy has changed dramatically. You know, the property tax base now, a majority of the property tax base is homeowners. So every time somebody needs some money, whether it's a school district, a city, a county, a irrigation district, whoever it is, they go to the property taxpayer. And we've got a $3 billion tourist economy in this state, and those people essentially get a free ride 
all the time they're in Montana. Would you say that if you put it up for a vote again, though, that what would happen to a sales tax? It'd probably get beat. Yeah. I, I mean, there. this is Montana. Yeah. Here it is. I'll, I'll, I'll summarize Montana for you in my mind. It's uh, hunting, fishing, church on Sunday, football on Friday night, no sales tax. <laughs> That's Montana. <laughs> That's how I see it. And I'm, gee, Mark Roscoe had it on a ballot in 1992. He was a very popular governor. I mean, that thing got beat, you know, three four to one. Three to one. Three to and, one. Uh, Seventy-five you know, percent against it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what it is in Montana that whether they understand the idea about consumption and production and the value, or they just don't like loose change. But a sales tax is not popular. And that and that sales tax leveraging that was done by Forrest in the election uh, was really one of the critical beginnings of this whole era of change. Oh yeah. Uh, and it, it, it opened the door for that long period. We're looking at a period from 1965 to 1980. And that involves the 67 legislature and the 68 election. And then once Forrest got in in 1969. Now he was, uh, 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 and we'll, get, we'll come back to the sales tax because after the Babcock loss in 1968, when they went to the 69 session, in spite of the big brouhaha in 67, they pulled in their horns. They said, well, that's been decided. You know, Forrest beat Tim pretty bad. We're not going to do the sales tax. Now, there are other battles that occurred in 1960-69 session that then followed. And then 71, it became, it rose again. The sales tax rose again. And we'll get back into that. But in the meantime, in 1969 session, when Forrest came in, uh, as he had talked a bit during the uh, during the election, he said, "We've got to get this government in order," and went after the reorganization as one of his primary things. Yeah. Well, up until that time, state government was a real mess. I mean, there are 160 independent boards and commissions. There was no accountability, and uh, you know, you had uh, everybody had a commission or a board or something like that. And you know, if you wanted to, you know, if somebody uh, made a mistake, uh, the governor was virtually powerless to deal with that. I mean, uh, you know, if somebody on the fishing game or the liquor control board had done something wrong or wasn't representing the people or doing the services that providing the service that they were supposed to be, you know, that they were hired, uh, it really wasn't much you could do about it. And so the whole idea and the, the structure was so di so diffused and unaccountable. I mean, you just couldn't make things happen. You couldn't move things forward. And uh, the executive authority was, you know, virtually non-existent. And, uh, you know, most of the authority, you know, was held by the legislature. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of governors, but, you know, they were in a lot of ways just kind of caretakers. You know, well, and, it's and, almost, uh, you can almost make the case that the diffused structure of state government simply empowered the power structure outside of government. Yeah, and, you know, and that was exactly. And the corporations, the special interests, whoever, however you want to call them, I mean, they relied on the legislature. Those guys figured it out. You know, I was uh, down in Bozeman one night at a city council meeting, and we had a very positive result, and we got essentially what we were trying to do, and it happened. And we had a really good discussion about it. And I was driving home and I was thinking, why the hell doesn't the legislature work like this? You know, and then it came to me. And uh, Anaconda, Montana Power, the railroads, everybody else uh, understood a long, long time ago. It's easier to deal with 150 people locked up in a building in Helena in the middle of the winter for 60 days than it is to go out and deal with 56 counties and 129 cities and towns. And this state, for all of its progressive, uh, you know, attitudes and uh, in terms of local control, and I'm getting into my business here a little bit, but that's a, that's a, that fits into what we're talking about. Here. In terms of local control, uh, Montana is is w way behind uh, most of the states in the West, and that relates to what was going on back in before 1971 when executive reorganization was uh, was passed that the legislature is where the power was and 
and that's where the influence could be applied and that's why uh, you know we'll deal with this in Helena next winter. So the, 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 the reorganization really was to bring control to a governor and, and uh, take away some of the external control. And the other thing that struck me is, uh, and I remember Forrest saying this, uh, uh, when he referred, he said, you know, we'll get all the nuts in the cage together. Remember when he said that? And he, and, 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 uh, and he meant the bureaucrats because either the power structure on the outside was empowered or the bureaucrats were empowered, but the elected officials were not empowered. Yeah. And that was the change he made uh, was to go after that. And, and there was a strategic genius in what he did, but I, I wonder if you might uh, uh, talk about kind of what you sense his strategic genius. Well, is. I mean, you know, anybody anywhere in this country you say, do you want your government to be more effective? Do you want it to be more responsive? Do you want it to be more accountable? Those are all the buzzwords, and they mean something. And, uh, you know, there's a practical meaning to every one of those words, and that's what it was all about. The government was out of control. It was spending too much money. Uh, periodic bud budget crisis is just like now. You know, you go from a surplus to a deficit, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, people were concerned about, you know, uh, the Republicans trying to uh, apply a new tax to fund the government that really didn't work. So the whole idea, and 20 is plenty, and the whole idea, and all through the campaign, uh, we talked about efficiency and getting rid of duplication, and there were too many people involved and too many people getting paid, and there's 160 boards and commissions, and they've all got some part of the budget. And the whole idea is, you know, to, you elect a governor. He's the chief executive of the state of Montana, and he should hire the people that are working for him, and they should be accountable to him. And if something goes wrong, he has the power to fix it. That's what it was all about. We didn't talk about that as much as we talked about efficiency and getting rid of duplication and things like that. I mean, this is still politics, and you've got to use the language. But he told me one time what this is really about. Do you know what this is really about? And, I, you know... I said, I think I do. He says, no, you don't. He says, what it's really about is that when the next guy that gets this job has a problem, he'll be able to fix it. And that's what it was about, giving the governor the authority he needed to be an effective manager, which he is hired to do when he's elected. That's so, what it was about. Yeah, and part of that is you appoint department directors, and if you need to fire one of them? Yeah. You fire him. That was it. He said, you know, the next guy, if there's some rat in the outfit, he can get rid of him. <laughs> and that's exactly what it was. Well, uh, you know. Uh, I mean, you can't go out and run a campaign on that. You know, efficiency and duplication and those things. <laughs> that, well, that you, sounds, yeah, you, I don't think you run a campaign no, saying, that, I want to be able to fire people. Yeah, that sounds yeah. a lot better, yeah. you know. And so then uh, everybody said, well, if this happens, then the, the governor will have this vast patronage system, you know. Yeah. And it'll be, oh, it'll be corrupt and it, it, you know if you're a friend of the governor's you'll be taken care of if you're not they'll send you down the road and Forrest Anderson like I said many times is a very practical guy and some, somebody said something to him about patronage one time he said I'll tell you about the patronage system you've got one job and you fill it what you end up with is nine enemies and one ingrate and that was his description of the patronage system and it's perfectly accurate yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I always thought that was one of the the, the, the better s statements I'd ever heard. You yeah, know, all these people you. apply for the job, yeah. and then one of them is an ingrate, and the rest of them are well, mad you, at you. you. Just, just look at it. You know, <laughs> there's nine guys out there that didn't get the job. Well, uh, I'm better qualified than that guy. I hate the governor, and then the guy that got the job probably doesn't think he's getting paid enough. Yeah, and so he you know. seemed to have spoken his mind, though. I remember when he oh, went yeah. down to Miles City one day, and uh, and he said, uh, "Farmers and ranchers don't pay their taxes." Oh enough. well, yeah, that, and <laughs> that kind of got excited. People excited well, a bit. That was one of the longer days of my life. You know, <laughs> he, he came in the office one day. He said, "I've invited to speak to the stock growers convention." I probably the first Democrat they've ever invited. He said, you know, let's, uh, I used to write speeches for him, so he said, let's get something really good. Not the usual stuff, but the, something really good, new and different, something that I can use to connect with these guys. And so uh, uh, I spent a couple of days over at the Department of Livestock, and we did a lot of research about 
you know, what was going on and all of the, the shenanigans in the cattle market and how the prices were being manipulated. And, you know, we went down and he gave this speech. And he, we always, the written word was more important in those days. The governor's speeches were always on the desk the morning that they were given. And, the, you know, the deal was he would say that. That's what he would say. He would, mm -hmm. the, the guarantee was he would make that speech. But then he would take his glasses off. And sometimes all hell broke loose. So he goes down to Miles City and he gives this speech, and it was pretty good. And it finishes up with you know kind of a kind of a tribute to the American West and the cattlemen, and America will always be a great nation as long as you guys are out there independently, you know, taking providing, you know, the food for the people, you know, and maintaining the spirit of the West and all of this stuff. And they really liked it. And they stood up and they gave him a standing ovation. So he took his glasses off. And he said, do you like that? And I said, well, I need to tell you. He said, that speech was written by a kid from Butte who's never seen a cow. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> and the real reason I come to Miles City was to tell you, I don't think you guys are paying enough taxes. And I'm going back to Helen and do something about it. <laughs> so we got out into the patrol car and the guy says, you guys look like you're in a hurry. I said, yeah, we are. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, that, you know, and the, the people that were trying to manage him, which was impossible, but, you know, it, it was always nervous when the glasses came off, you know, but I mean, most of the time when he took the glasses off and spoke off the top of his head, what he really told people is what he wanted them to hear in the truth, not the stuff that's manufactured here in Helena by guys like me that wrote the speeches. And, and by the way, that was a factual statement. I mean, as yeah, difficult yeah. politically as it yeah. was, there was an underpayment of taxes and yeah. relationship in, in, the, in that industry. It takes guts to well, say that at the stock growers convention. You, yeah, no kidding. No the guy kidding. had guts, yeah, no doubt yeah, about it. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, well, let's talk about a little bit about the 20s plenty thing, because I want to I want to just comment about the strategic brilliance that he brought to getting that done, because he went into the 19. If we're going to reorganize the executive, and we're going to make it effective and responsible, which takes power away from the established powers outside of government. Thinking about uh, that and uh, other things that uh, took some of the strength away from the Montana Power and the Anaconda Company and the stock growers and the, the power structure that really had run things for decades. Uh, uh, he ended up uh, bringing a bill forth to uh, create uh, 20 departments or less, so create a reorganization commission uh, uh, was the first step. And the reorganization commission ended up, that bill ended up, uh, being himself as chairman and eight legislators. Uh, but they selected a director, which was someone that he trusted, which was Duke Crowley. And all the research went on. We, and we're doing, going to do a program about reorganization per se. But when he finished getting the bill passed on the reorganization, which included an appropriation to fund it and to fund the staff to do the research, then he called him back into special session four days after the session was over. And he signed the bill on the 60th day, creating the commission. Four days later, they were back in on a special session, and he, and he shoveled to him a constitutional amendment that was mirrored after what was done in Colorado that said, according to the Constitution, there couldn't be more than 20 departments. And that if that were to pass, it would put the force of the Constitution onto the legislature, making them do it. Because I think he knew that there had been eight other research studies on reorganization that went nowhere. So he put that in, and by gosh, if they didn't get almost every vote for it, and it went on the ballot. And that's where the 20s plenty came yeah. in. Well, the real strategy there, and it's, uh, you know, it always works, is you find a problem that needs to be solved. And ineffective government was a problem in Montana. I mean, the government was lost. There's no doubt about it. It had no direction, no defined purpose or anything like that. So you find the problem. Then you come up with a fair solution. And a fair solution was to reorganize it and get rid of all of these boards and commissions, which were really getting in the way of effective management. And then the third part of the deal is put a message together that uh, people understand and believe. And that, that's how it worked. That was the strategy. The problem, the solution, and the way to sell the solution. 
And if you look at the election, on executive reorganization, it passed every county in the state of Montana. It got 70% of the votes. Mm -hmm. And that was the effective combination of a problem that needs to be solved, a fair solution, and a good message. And all of that came together. And the people that worked on the Executive Reorganization Commission, George Bowsman and those people, and you know, uh, guys like you, they did a tremendous amount of work. I mean, that's a very complicated operation. And they were able to, as I said, you know, and you said too, is you take 156 boards of commission scattered all over the place and put them into 20 departments. Well, a lot of that structure is still there. The boards and commissions are still there. I can remember during the election, the barbers were concerned that oh, they, they were going to... Big time with the barbers. Yeah, the yeah. barbers were going to lose their licensing board. Yeah. Well, the barbers still have a licensing board, but all of those professions and whatever they're called... Packaged together. Yeah, they are very, very protective of their particular licensing board. That gives their profession credibility, and it keeps bootleggers, or whatever you want to call them, from coming in and cutting hair without a license, which is what this was all about in a lot of ways. And so, uh, you know, that was a big problem in reorganization. But they're all still there. You, you can find them in the state phone book if they ever publish them. They're buried in, but they're structurally under control. Yeah, under I, control. Think they're, I think they're in the Department of Labor someplace, yeah. yeah. I remember when the Barber's Board, uh, I went out and gave a speech in Butte at what was the War Bonnet Inn, I think, at the time. And uh, uh, the barbers were having a convention, and Frank Senate went over. Frank was an assistant with you along yeah. in the governor's office along with you. And we went there, and I gave a speech about it. And one of them stood up, and he said, uh, there were two things that were said I remembered. One was, this reorganization was, you're, you're trying to foist an alien form of government upon us. I remember those words, yeah. foist an alien form of government upon us. Well, it but was one, alien because it was efficient. Yeah, and one guy got up and says, now you have to have 20 departments, huh? And I said, yeah, we have to have 20 departments or less. He says, how many have you guys planned for? And I said, well, right now we're planning for 19. He says, well, take us with their one staff and make us the 20th department. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that would have been good. <laughs> you know, so, so there was a sense that the bureaucrats were really uh, kind of out of control but always wanted to consolidate their, their little yeah. bit of power. Uh, that they might have, you know, I think but he, he wanted the power to be in the hands of the governor. You know, I think when these guys came out of the shadows and started opposing this, and it revealed to the people of Montana just how, uh, you know, uh, ridiculous the, yeah. the, the structure was, you know. I mean, some guy wanting to have a state agency devoted exclusively to barbers. Somebody down in Billings uh, reads that in the papers, sees it on TV, says, my God, <laughs> the governor's on the right track. we got to go along with this. I mean... Yeah, I mean, the, the state government has really grown, and it's big, and uh, it's. I think it's efficient. I think they do a really good job. But can you imagine spending the money we spend today on uh, state government under the old system? Mm -hmm. I mean, it would never have happened. The people would have uh, been an open revolution. I mean, I sort of been, you know, it, it just couldn't happen. I mean, so now you you get you elect a guy as governor. He's the chief executive. He's the guy. And if somebody screws up, he answers to the governor. And the important part of that is that the governor answers directly to the voters. And that's why the thing works. That's why it works every place else. I don't think it worked that way in Montana for a while. You know, well, and again, I think it, it is important to keep relating it back to the fact that if you didn't have a powerful executive, yeah. or and for example, if you didn't have a modernized legislature too, uh, if you didn't have some strength in the government itself that yeah. makes it work, who's empowered? Yeah. Well, I think the you see, economic interests yeah. were empowered. I think you see some balance now. I mean, the governor and the executive, right. they've got to work together. And, uh, you know, in the recent years, we've had Democratic governors and Republican legislators. And, uh, you know, you got guys out on the front steps of the Capitol with branding irons, vetoing bills and doing things like that. But, you know, there is balance there and there is checks. And I think that works. You know, people are always complaining about activist courts. Well, courts are also part of the system. And I think up until reorganization, the courts and the legislature might have been, you know, balancing each other. But the executive did not have the authority necessary to be an effective check on the legislature. The veto was always there, but the ability to make things happen wasn't. And if you can't make things happen, there's no sense being in the business. Mm -hmm.
Now, also on the ballot in 1970 was uh, uh, the the, the uh, decide decision to call uh, have a vote on a constitutional yeah. convention, and uh, the legislature in, in uh, 71. I mean, it had a set an election, and there was a, there was a special election set for late '71 for the for the to to rewrite our constitution, and a lot of states were uh, trying to rewrite constitutions at that time. Although most of them failed, most of them failed. Uh, tell us about how Forrest dealt with the constitutional convention issue from as you saw it from the inside. Well, you know, the constitutional convention was. No different than a session of the legislature. I mean, that place was crawling with lobbyists. You know, everybody was trying to get in there and protect or promote their interest, you know, not in the laws of the, you know, the statutes, but in the Constitution. Uh, the uh, in the big law. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. The, what was interesting about that, and I, you know, I'm just kind of, I knew a lot of those people. I relate kind of back to Butte. But the people that were sent from Butte over to Helena to represent Silverville County, in the Constitutional Convention were very well qualified people. You know, some of the best attorneys in town, uh, you know, mm -hmm. served in the Constitu Constitutional Convention. These people were very intelligent. They understood the, the challenge and they found a way to get it done. You know, and I mean, it was uh, interesting. It, it, was, it was fascinating to watch how that thing, you know, proceeded. And some of the debates in the Constitutional Convention are some of the best you'll ever hear. I mean, you got like guys like Wade the Hood and Dave Holland and Leo Graybill and people like that. There were a lot of women there that really care about government. You know, and the League of Women Voters and groups like that were really interested. In and all there this. weren't women in the legislature no, to any degree no, at that point. No. So that was a really a new thing yeah. when there were all these women in the Constitutional Convention. And then you Convention. have to remember that this was like probably the most progressive period in Montana history. You know, I mean, we're coming out of Vietnam and I mean the environmental movement is emerging and there was a whole new attitude in Montana I mean and power sort of had seemed to flow to the people I mean it, it wasn't you know the Anaconda Company couldn't get its way anymore the Montana Power Company I mean I forced that he had a political problem he didn't recognize the importance of the environmental movement in Montana you know I mean he did a lot of things that benefited the environmental movement but he was still focused on jobs and things like that, such so traditional old style democratic issues. But, you know, the Constitutional Convention that changed everything. I mean, there were a lot of women there. I, I bet there were 20 women in the, in, yep, in the Constitutional close, yeah, Convention. Yeah. And a, a lot of really bright, capable people, a lot of attorneys that weren't there to promote an interest, but they were there. They were like given an assignment we have to write a new Constitution. They took it very seriously. And they did it very well. And by the way, the, one of the unique things was that uh, uh, the chairman or the president, uh, Leo Grable, uh, made a decision, and they voted on it and accepted it, to have them sit alphabetically so they didn't split up by party. Yeah. Well, they, uh, and it yeah, made a big difference. There were no parties. It yeah. was nonpartisan. No, it, no, it wasn't. That's not true. Was it true? That's oh, yeah. True. I didn't there know, were I didn't 59 realize. Democrats. Oh, I didn't there. realize that. Yeah. Now, by the way, I want to mention this. Uh, There's uh, a great story about that. This, this, uh, just this very quickly, this uh, uh, edition of the Montana Magazine has got a great, great article in it about Forrest Anderson. Uh, and uh, it's called, uh, let's see, what do they call it? Forrest Anderson, uh, the 1972 Constitution. And the reshaping of Montana, and it's uh, Brian Shovers wrote it. And it, and if you don't, if you get a chance, get this. I'm mean, just saying to the viewers, get a chance to, to take a look at this article. It's a wonderful article, and it talks about his interface with the Constitution and how he helped shape getting it going. Uh, but he kind of let them have their hand to do it. But it was interesting that when, and then we'll get back to your story here. But it was interesting that when. The vote occurred in the middle of uh, the primary election in 1972 on it. It passed by about 2,000 votes. And there were some people suggested it didn't have an absolute majority. And Forrest signed uh, the Constitution and they turned it into Frank Murray. Did, were you part yeah. of and Tell us about that. Because uh, didn't he have to re sign it a second time in front of Frank? Yep. Well, there was a lot of controversy over the Constitution. This is a very big change, and it, things are coming fast, and people are getting a little, a little timid. You know, there's a, there's a very progressive time in Montana, but still, you know, there's a lot of changes coming, and there was a lot of opposition to the Constitution. 
and people had it their way under the old document that didn't want to see this happen. And so it was a very, very close election. It was about 2,000 votes. I think it was Mike Mansfield might have been on the ballot at that time. And Mike Mansfield always drew a great vote. And more people voted in the Senate election than voted on the constitutional question. So the number of people that voted for the Constitution was not a majority of all the people that voted in the election. It was a majority on the question, but it wasn't a majority of all those who voted. And so that was the challenge, and they were going to go to court. So Forrest signed the Constitution, and uh, Frank Murray refused to witness his signature, which would make it official. So they because had, he wasn't physically present when he yeah, signed it. So they had a land board meeting, and uh, they went through some documents. And he said to Frank, "What about the Constitution?" He says, "I won't witness your signature." And he said, "Well, there it is." And he had me in the room, and I had a camera, and we took a picture. <laughs> Frank was from Butte. He says, "What's he doing here?" And we took a picture. I still have the picture. And Forrest signed the Constitution. And we had a picture of Frank sitting in the room watching him sign it, which is a technically witnessing it. And that's how that happened. That's how the Constitution got done. Yeah. I, by, the, by the way, the, the, uh, you're right about lack of a majority, uh, but it was not based upon, because it was in the primary, but it was based upon the fact that the side issues the, the death penalty and gambling and unicameral legislature garnered a lot more votes than the main body. Yeah. And that's what made him make that case go to the court. But he, he made Frank witness it uh, yeah. after all. Yeah. yeah, at a land board meeting. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. a funny, funny story about the Constitution. You know, the city of Helena passed a non-smoking ordinance. You couldn't smoke in bars anymore. Geez, that was a big controversy in this town. So the they went to court, the tavern owners, and they got the thing stopped. So the city of Helena was, you know, defending their position, and they hired an attorney uptown. And he called me up, and he says, I got an argument I wanted, you know, on this non-smoking ordinance. Tell me what you think. And I says, okay. And he says, well, don't you think that clean indoor air is protected by the Constitution under the right to a quality environment? I said, I don't think you can infer that if you've ever watched <laughs> the videotape of the Constitutional Convention. And you get up there and the debate on the clean and healthy environment, and one of the speakers is Wade DeHood. He's got a big cigar. Yeah, right. <laughs> you can't even make out the people in the room that the, the, there's so much smoke in there. There was an ashtray on every desk. They I used think, to do that in those yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, I said, no, I don't think you can. I don't think they were talking about clean indoor air uh, when they were debating that particular article. Well, at least the smoke-filled room was actually where the representatives yeah. were present. All of them. You oh know. yeah, you, uh, uh, you know, you could, uh, you know, you could smoke a ham in that place in the old <laughs> days. It was great. <laughs> I used to smoke. I enjoyed smoking. It was good. Yeah. Tell us about uh, uh, when the uh, folks came to Forrest uh, about the filming of uh, Dustin Hoffman's oh, yeah. movie. Well, you know, smart people have good senses of humor and they're witty. You know, you, if you, witty people are generally pretty smart. And Forrest Anderson never tried to be funny. I mean, he, you, you meet guys in a bar, they'll tell you a joke. I heard a great story. He never told you a story. I mean, but he was funny because he was more practical than anybody else. And so when you, you, people would be talking about something, and he'd say what he thought. It was funny because it was so damn practical, and people would sit around and say, Jesus Christ, I wish I'd have thought of that. But anyway, uh, they made this movie in town of Brown Billings called Little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman. And some guy from the movie studio, they had the world premiere down in Billings at the Babcock Theater. And the guy, guy from the, Forrest Anderson was about 5'4", you know, a little tiny guy. He looked big, but he wasn't. He wasn't very big at all. And uh, some guy called me from the movie studio, and he said, uh, we're having our premiere down here tonight. Would the governor be willing to proclaim Little Big Man Day in Montana in honor of our premiere? And I said, well, he's back there. Let me go ask him. So I went back, and I said, they want to have you to proclaim Little Big Man Day in Montana. He says, you tell that phony Hollywood guy. Every day in Montana is Little Big Man Day. <laughs> Every no, day is Little no, Big Man Day. Yeah, he was a funny guy. I mean, you know, the thing in Miles City, but you know, he was interesting to talk to. You know, 
And like I said, you know, he was so well qualified. He was a really smart guy. I mean, he was clever, but not cunning. Just he understood. You know, and I learned so much from him, and I, everybody that ever worked for him, you know, valued the time that they spent with him. And I can't think of anybody that ever did work for him that really didn't like him. You know, he, people say he was kind of brusque, and he was, you know, he kind of kept to himself, and he was hard to work for. I never saw that. I mean, he was a generous guy. I mean, and, uh, you know, he, he, to be around him, every hour you spent with that guy advanced your education. I mean... Everything I've been able to do, you know, in this business, 33 years uh, working for the League of Cities, uh, most of what I know is based on what I learned in those three years with Forrest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and a lot of people said, uh, a lot of people are gone now. But a lot of your friends work there, and I bet you they told you the same thing. Well, there's a huge respect for Forrest, and, you know, and, and, and history, I think, is uh, treats him kindly. Uh, and the more time passes, the more I think people begin to realize how important he was uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the emergence of the Constitution at that time, the reorganizing of the, the, the legislature or the executive and, and, and the sales tax stuff too. Let's jump back into that sales tax in 71 because when, when the Reorganization Commission finished its work uh, and had a bill, in 1971 that went to the legislature. It had the Constitution, uh, constitutional amendment passed overwhelmingly, 70 percent, so they had to reorganize the executive. They could have put it off for two years, but he had the hammer on him because of the Constitution. But that year there was a big, big battle in the 71 session over the sales tax. It came back again after being away for two years. Yeah. And it, uh, it, it culminated at the end of the year, but the, the, the big fight was in the legislature. They never could come together on that. Well, it came back. And in those days, the legislature lasted 60 days. 60 calendar days? Yeah. So, you know, they were in a, but they couldn't get the work done. They put a shroud over the clock. And they pretended like time had stopped. If it was 59th day or 60th day and it was midnight, they covered the clock yeah. and kept working until. So, yeah, they went 104 days, and they were deadlocked in the House, 50-50. Nobody changed their vote. You know, and it was 49 Republicans voting for the sales tax, but one or two voting against I mean, it, it didn't change much, but one of the people that was against the sales tax was Ed Smith from Dagmar. Big Ed Smith. Yeah, who later ran for governor. And uh, so, I mean, they'd come in, and anybody change their mind, nope, they'd adjourn for the this went on 104 days. It went into the middle of June. And I, I'll never forget that. Uh, that's the year I got married. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, things were kind of, we, uh, my wife and I had planned to take a trip, you know, but the special session was hanging over it and all that. And so that wasn't such a good thing. But finally, you know, Forrest said, we got a deal. And they negotiated the deal. And this is a pure stroke of genius. You could, back then, put an either-or proposition on the ballot. You could put a choice. You can't do that anymore. It's not allowed by mm -hmm. federal interpretation of the federal constitution. So the choice between the vo for the voters of Montana was, a, I think it was a 40% income surcharge. tax surcharge yeah. or a 2% sales tax. And so, you know, the, the campaign went on and... Uh, you know, and you guys at the party were instrumental in uh, revealing where the sources of funding for the pro sales tax forces were coming from. As you might imagine, you know, it was the big corporations and people like that. But, you know, in Montana, there's a lot of resistance to the sales tax. And uh, once the, you know, the funding story came out, you know, thing, you could just feel that the sales tax effort had just lost steam. It was just dead in the water. And, so people voted for the, you know, the 40% income tax surcharged, uh, you know, about a three to one margin, mm -hmm. uh, by a significant margin. I'll never forget, he came in the office the next day and it was, uh, you know, he had on a great looking suit, a snappy tie, and he's kind of happy and he didn't show a lot of emotion. But somebody said, why are you so happy? He says, 
I'm probably the first governor in the history of the United States <laughs> to raise taxes 40% and didn't get lynched overnight. <laughs> <laughs> but that people did not want that sales tax. You know, and like I've said many times, you know, uh, sales tax is not a popular idea in Montana. Well, and part of it, of course, was that the sales tax was permanent and the surcharge was yeah. temporary, and so it got them past the problem. Yeah. Uh, they they went, remember, they went and they had committees and they had special sessions, they had two special sessions and uh, extraordinary sessions that kept going all those days, and they had summit committees and foothills committees and everything else, and it wasn't until they forged this deal to put it on the ballot and the, the gentleman that was in charge on the Republican side was Jim Lucas, who yeah. was, of course, a great, uh, uh, a great guy, yeah. a very brilliant lawyer from Miles City, but he was locked stock and barrel on the sales tax, yeah. and it, uh, he, never had an he never had a political future after that. No, and, you know, it's kind of interesting that, uh, you know, that I don't know what kind of, what kind of, uh, promises are made or what kind of deal was involved, but, you know, to get those guys to agree to go back to the ballot with the sales tax, you know, after the 68 election, uh, I think it was a strategic error on their part. They might have been able to win in the legislature. It would have been a hell of a lot easier to get one vote in the House than it would have been to get a majority across the state of Montana. I mean, and that was a technical error. You know, the governor would have vetoed it, but you know, the, the next time, maybe not. So there's all kinds of things there, and that thing going on the ballot, I mean, that that just about demolished the Republican Party in Montana for 10 years. Yeah, it did. You had Democratic majorities in the, the legislature up until the, you know, late 70s. Well, if you look at it, uh, it's, it's indicative of that empowerment of the people that is part of the crucible of change. Yeah. Uh, it was if you left it into the legislative hallways where the lobbyists were strong, uh, things may not have happened. But the Constitutional Convention uh, uh, ended up being voted on, and they were going to have a convention, and then they voted on what they yeah. they did, and they voted on the twenties plenty amendment, and they voted on the sales tax. And by the way, the interesting coincidence of this is that the sales tax election uh, was. Uh, piggybacked onto the CONCON election, that the CONCON election for delegates to the Constitutional yep. Convention was set for November of 71, and they were looking for a convenient place to put the sales tax on the ballot, and it was on the ballot in 71. And what it did was people were so overwhelmingly rejecting the Republican position that the Constitutional Convention emerged with 59 Democrats out of a hundred yeah. and it was like wait a minute this made a big difference so the, the so the voice the voice of the people and i think forrest instinctively understood that that where the folks were yeah. uh i guess you don't go that kind of history of being involved for so long without understanding that well, he never lost an election how many guys can say that yeah yeah yeah, yeah he never yeah. did so uh we're, we're looking at that uh, uh that made a difference now as you as we ran into uh, we had the reorganized uh, executive branch, a, a new constitution, uh, the sales tax uh, uh, debacle for the Republicans. So as you went into the uh, 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 72 election, uh, tell us about what happened uh, as Forrest ended up deciding that he, finding that he couldn't run for re-election. Well, you know, he'd had some medical problems. He had a you know, I don't know exactly what it was, a high hiatal hernia or something, and, you know, uh, he had it, he'd had it. There's a great story about, there's a guy that Forrest really liked, a young guy, his dad had been mayor of Butte one time, and he grew up in Hamlet, in Hamlet, a guy named Bob McTaggart. Yeah. And he traveled with the governor, and he took, he took care of him, and him and the governor were great friends. And uh, he was sort of like the governor's bodyguard before mm -hmm. there were such things. Forrest went out to Seattle and um, he claimed that they, in, they removed his spleen without th his approval. So he sued the hospital in Seattle and was all over the newspapers in Montana. 
We were in a bar one night, and Bob McTaggart was there, and this old guy that was a bartender downtown, Bill Condon, said, uh, McTaggart, he says, uh, you're the governor's bodyguard, aren't you? He said, yeah, I am. He said, you're not very good at your job. He says, what do you mean? He said, well, if you're such a good bodyguard, how come the governor lost the spleen? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, that, that was the kind of the things that were going on in those days. But, uh, uh, no, I mean, you know, going into the 72 election, now, he wasn't feeling well. And I knew him really well, and uh, him and I were good friends. And I used, after he left office, I used to go see him all the time. I like his family, and his son is a friend of mine. And I just loved to sit and talk to him. And if you were in Forest House, you could always smoke. That was, that was an advantage. But, uh, no, it was just fun to talk to him and, uh, you know, his opinion. And I asked him for advice and things like that. And, you know, and so I got to know him really well. And he was sick. He didn't feel very well. He got to a point where, you know, he was just on a liquid diet and things like that. And uh, he was sick. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what happened there at the end, but uh, he, he did not feel very good. So he couldn't run. And Tom Judge had been sitting there, you know, chomping it. You know, he was pawing at the ground, getting ready to run for governor. And, you know, when he was elected lieutenant governor in 68, that was before the new constitution. And, the, you know... The, they were separate. Yeah, the offices were separate, you know. So they were never really close. You know, it wasn't a team like it is now. You don't go pick somebody and put them in the office down the hall. I mean, Judge was there. He was elected separately from the governor. And they weren't a lot alike. And it wasn't really a team, but uh, Forrest had a judge a great opportunity to be governor, and he took full advantage of it, and he won that election, and he won the next one. And, you know, uh, Tom Judge, I think, was a good governor. He was progressive. He was more progressive than Forrest. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was more attuned to the environmental movement and things like that. He did quite a bit of good work on the institutional side. And uh, actually, he was a good governor. If you look at it, uh, Tom Judge was elected at the age of 38 as yeah. governor, which means he was 34 when he was yeah, elected yeah. lieutenant governor. And, uh, uh, obvi you know, he was clearly in the flow of kind of the emerging electorate oh, at, yeah, at that yeah. time. Young guy. It was an interesting story about uh, delegating because some people think that uh, Forrest delegated a lot, and yet he seemed to have his hands on the control of the, the government by virtue of who he talked to. I think Ted Schwinden said that, uh, you know, he was called by Gordon Bennett and said, the governor would like to have you be the land commissioner. And uh, he said, give me a day to figure it out. And then, you know, after about a day, he was trying to figure it out. And Gordon called back and says, you know, the governor's not a patient man. We'd like to have an answer. And so they got an answer and he came up and, 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 and Ted said, I went in the office and, and the governor said, uh, uh, do A, B, C, and D and don't get in any trouble and you won't hear from me. Yeah, that's and, exactly the way it was. I, uh, when I got hired, I uh, had been working at the paper in Butte. And, uh, somebody in the legislature told me the governor was looking for a guy, and I've always been kind of interested in politics. So I called and got an interview, and I came over to see the governor. And he couldn't meet with me in the morning because uh, he got stung by a bee and his hand had swollen up. So I sat around. I went back to see him. And we talked for a little while. And, you know, I, I, first thing, the first impression I had was a, how little he was. He's a, he was a small guy. That's what he told me one time. I'm for the little people. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, we had a nice talk, and I left, and I figured, well, you know, I didn't know if I wanted to leave Butte, and then the other thing is, you know, I didn't know if the interview had gone very well, and so I forgot all about it. And one night, one of the old-time reporters there and came in the office, he worked days, I worked nights, he happened to come in, I think he came in to get some money out of his nose or something. He said, Jesus, the governor called me today, he wanted to know about you. I said, what'd you tell him? I said, I told him you're a good kid. So thank you. So about a week later, my mother called me. And uh, she said, what the hell have you done now? I said, what do you mean? She says, there's a letter here from the governor of Montana. I says, I'm not up and read it for me. She says, read it. Dear Alec, it was nice to meet you whenever it was, uh, if you want the job, you can start Tuesday. And that was it. <laughs> you know, not, I showed up, went to work, and he told me, here's what I want you to do, do it, and you and I will get along fine. If you don't, I'll find another guy. That was a simple, easy way to do it. You knew where you stood, and that's a perfect place to be.
He had an interesting mixture of very young people. You were young. Uh, I was young. Most of the people in our reorganization staff, Frank Sennett was young, Gary Wicks was young, the staff was young, and yet there were seasoned people in there. There was Gordon Bennett around yeah. and, and uh, folks like that that were, were, it was an interesting mixture of, and Duke Crowley, and yeah. it was an interesting mixture of the, the younger and more seasoned people that he drew to it. Well, kind of funny, I mean, I didn't know much about legislature when I showed up over here, but by 71 I figured I knew my way around a little bit, so had the governor's office budget club to talk to the chairman of the uh, subcommittee and look at the budget. And uh, the, the talking point was that we had fewer people who were paying lower salaries than uh, the Republicans had ever paid. And there should be no problem, you know, getting this budget approved. So Good I, management. I go up my talk to, yeah. I go up my talk to the guy, a guy named Tom Ains. He's a senator from Missoula. He also happened to be the chairman of the, I mean, the president of Montana Food Distributors. Tom Ains, yeah. 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 Food Distributors Association. And they had a bill in that session of the legislature to allow them to sell wine in grocery stores. So I go up there and I lay it all out for Senator Ains. He says, well, he said, how old are you? I said, I'm 26. What about this other guy? Well, he's 26 and the other guy's 24. And <laughs> the Ron Richards, he's the boss. He's the old guy. He wasn't guy. that old. He's the old guy. He's 31. He says, you know, this really bothers me. There's an awful lot of money for a bunch of greenhorns. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back downstairs. So I told Flores. He said, you go back up. You tell that guy. Uh, if he wants to ever sell a bottle of wine in a grocery store in the state of Montana, he'll take another look at that budget. So I told the guy, he delivered the message. He looks at me and he says, you know what I like about this? I says, what's that, Senator? He says, young people are interested in government again. <laughs> <laughs> my mother was still alive. I called my mother. I said, you know, I went to college. I took political science. I hung around the courthouse. I thought I knew this. Yeah, I said, I found this secret today. It's magic. It's leverage. You not got to know where to put the pole under the rock to move things. And I figured it out today. I said, I don't know at all, but I know how it's done, and that's very nice to know. And it was. It was magical. The guy just, boom, changed his mind just like that. And now, that works. He, he knew the, the pressure, the leveraging points. You know, we're, we're just about running out. This hour has gone by very, very fast. And I wondered if you might have some kind of s summary uh, uh, words, some uh, evaluation words about how, about Forrest Anderson as someone who worked for him for almost all of his term. Yeah, well, I've said this many, many times. I mean, coming here, working for him changed my life, and I am grateful for that. But what I remember about him, I, I've said this, he's probably the smartest guy that I've ever met in politics. And, uh, I mean, he really knew what he was doing. He's also one of the most imposing people I've ever met. You know, like I said, he was five feet, four inches tall. But he would fill a room. He knew what he was doing, and that showed. And he had, you know, he had self-confidence. And he always, you know, had the eye. He knew where we were going. And we had a meeting, I'll never forget, the big budget crisis. This was before the sales tax election. And I said, Governor, you're in the box. So I went to Billings with him on the plane. I said, how are you going to get out of the box? He says, they haven't built a box. I can't get out of it. That was the sales <laughs> tax deal. But, you know, the guy was just that kind of a guy. I mean, he filled up the room. What we're going to end up doing is, uh, through a whole series of programs in, in the Crucible of Change, we're going to talk about how Forrest Anderson influenced the big changes in Montana uh, that we're talking about here, probably more than anybody else. So thank you for being our guest here today. Oh, yeah, I mean... Thank you for having me. I mean, I, I love talking about what happened, and I love to try to remind people that there was a time when government worked and people got things done, and he was a big part of it. So thanks. Thank